Number 32, unreasonable results. Letter A, calculate the minimum coefficient of friction needed for a car to negotiate an unbanked 50 meter radius curve at 30 meters per second. All right, so here's our little diagram. All right, right over here, guys. Here's the uh, vehicle. It's going around some unbanked uh, track. We're taking an aerial view here, and um, it has some right angular velocity. So what I'm going to do here is detail a free body diagram of this vehicle. Okay, so let's draw this set of axes. And the vehicle here I will put as a dot in red. Remember the vehicle has a certain mass, right? So the mass always points down. Okay, so I'm basically looking at this now as a... As a at a side view, okay, I'm looking at the side of the car now. This is like an aerial view. So here the weight of the vehicle is equal to mg. And there is a certain, um, right, normal force. That's the road um, exerting the force on upward right against the car. So I'll label this F uh, sub n. And in order for the car to make, right, this uh, circular path, it experiences a centripetal acceleration. Uh, towards the center of the circle. So therefore, in my picture here, I'm going to draw a little line that represents the centripetal acceleration. So there must be a net force pointing to the left, correct? As well. So let's draw that in. So there's some force here. Now what do we call that force? That's the centripetal force, right? Now, however, though, in this problem, that is true. But what else could it be called in this problem? What's keeping the car on the circular path? What's preventing the car from just sliding on out? What's the force of friction? Right? The force of friction between the tires and the road. So this, for, this centripetal force is really the same as the force of static friction. That is, the force of static friction is the force uh, being provided by the tires against the road to give it the force necessary to keep it on a circular path. All right, now knowing all this, how can we now um, calculate the minimum coefficient? Well, why don't we just start with labeling or uh, you know, listing out the, uh, the static force of friction uh, formula. So here the force of static friction, right, was less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. So now remember, I know it's less than or equal to, but we're trying to find the minimum, so I'm just gonna choose the equal uh, to value. So I'm gonna say equal, coefficient of static friction multiplied by the uh, normal force here. Now, question guys, what is the normal force? Well, the normal force here is exactly the same in magnitude, but opposite in direction of the weight, right? It's in equilibrium in the y direction. There is no acceleration in the y, there's only acceleration in the x. So I can say that the weight equals the normal force. This is just pointing down, this is just pointing up. So in other words, mg is the same thing as fn. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here in my formula is I'm gonna plug in mg. So the force of static friction is equal to coefficient of static friction multiplied now by mg. Okay, great. Now remember, I also said that the force of friction here, all right, the force of friction is the same thing as the uh, centripetal force. So here is now the connection. Okay, let's write our centripetal force formula right over here on the right. Let's write it out. Centripetal force is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by that object's acceleration, so specifically the centripetal acceleration. So if Fc right, is equal to force of friction and force of friction is equal to this, then this thing is equal to this. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this term on in to this equation now. So now I have coefficient of static friction multiplied by mg, okay, is equal to now mac. And if we're trying to find the coefficient of static friction, simply divide out now the mg from both sides. And notice what happens to the mass. It goes bye-bye. Toodaloo. All right, so now what do we have? We have centripetal acceleration divided by g. You might say, great, is this my formula? And you look back and you're like, oh, darn it. I'm given the radius and I'm given a velocity. So now, so now the next thought is, well, all I need to figure out is the relationship between centripetal acceleration and radius and velocity. And you're like, oh my God, here it is, right? There it is, ladies and gentlemen, that's the relationship. So what I can do here is I can plug this value 
on in for centripetal acceleration. What do we get then? This coefficient of static friction is equal to then. Now I could write this in a couple ways. I could write it v squared over r all over g, or I could write it v squared over rg. They're both literally the same. So I'm just going to leave it in this form. And guess what? This is our formula. Now, that being the formula, all I got to do is plug in the numbers, right? So I'll do it over here on the, on the left-hand side. Coefficient, oops, coefficient of static friction is equal to then 30.0 meters per second squared all over the radius, which was 50, times g 9.80. And just calculate it. So we got uh, 30 squared divided by 50 times 9.8, 1.84. Right, so I'll put the answer up here on the left because um, I ran out of, eh, you know what? I'm just going to move this on up a little bit. I'll put it right there on the bottom. So coefficient of static friction, 1.84, 1.84. And there we go. Okay, great. Now, letter B, what's unreasonable? Well, I think if I remember correctly, the value, static friction coefficient value for rubber on concrete was somewhere around 1.0. So this uh, coefficient is almost twice as large as what it, in reality it is. So that's kind of unreasonable. Letter C, they said which premises are unreasonable or inconsistent. I mean, you just can't make a turn like this unbanked. <laughs> that's basically what the unreasonable thing is. All right. Otherwise, you're going to go flying off the road. So, uh, so yeah. All right. Either you got to expand, right? Either... You have to, where's my pen? Either you have to expand the radius, right? Make it larger, or you have to reduce your speed, okay? Think about the math over here. In order for the coefficient to go down, you either reduce the numerator, meaning you lower your velocity, or you increase your denominator, meaning you increase the radius of the turn. And that should make intuitive sense. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Please remember to subscribe and look forward to helping you with the next question. Take care.